One of the things that kind of annoys me about a lot of hand tool woodworking instruction is there's so much focus on hand planes. I myself have done it. I've created a lot of videos on hand planing and hand planes, but the truth of the matter is hand saws, that's where it's at. That's where the most improvement in your woodworking can happen. By understanding how to use these guys, whether it's a half back like this or a back saw like this, our saws without backs. Mastering the hand saw will make everything better. It'll make your joinery go together better. It'll make your planing better. It'll, it's actually the fastest way to flatten a board with a saw. Make that saw cut first before you ever pick up the plane. And I'm constantly beating this into my students' heads over at the Hand Tool School. That's handtoolschool.net, in case you're curious. It's learn your saws and focus on your saws. And for that matter, focus on getting good saws in your shop before you worry about having a whole bunch of planes. I know guys that have 25, 30 different planes and they only use maybe one or two of them, but they'll use six, seven different hand saws. Mastering hand sawing will make you a better woodworker, whether you do a whole bunch of power tool work or you're fully hand tool focused. Having that hand saw skill will make things so much better. So what I wanna do is show you an excerpt from a much larger hand tool school lesson on the principles of hand sawing. Focus on these principles and all of your sawing will go better. And understanding these principles tells you exactly what you need to work on in order to improve your hand sawing. I've really been focused on trying to teach good sawing. And there's all kinds of little tips and things that I've thrown out over the last decade or so. And I finally have been able to distill all of those tips down to three points. Number one is if you can see the line, you can saw the line. Number two is you must let the saw do the work. And number three is you have to have that single geometric plane from saw plate to wrist, elbow to shoulder in order for the saw to run straight. That's the body mechanic side of things. To demonstrate this, I want to just take a really wonky bridle joint. This is a compound angle bridle joint um, that I have assembled and reassembled so many times that it's actually started to get a little loose on me. So you can see, here's how you tighten demonstration joiner. You put blue tape on it. That's how it tightens up over time. But what this is, is certainly I've got an angle here, but then I also have an angle in this direction. So this would be very typical to the, the joint of like the back leg of a chair, where the back leg of the chair, say this is the rail. Um, this would be the left rail. So the chair forms kind of a trapezoid shape. The, the rails splay out so the front is wider than the back. And usually the back legs you find may angle back a bit from the you know the parallel to the floor rail very very common a lot of times you will also find um, twist in this direction um, i actually talk about this in semester four with compound angle tenons one of the best ways to create this is actually plane the angle into the face of the rail rather than to uh, change the angle of the joinery for illustrating the principles of sawing number one you can see the line you can saw the line so what I've got here is I have to saw a shoulder that's at an angle to the face and is at an angle down, down the edge. So this, I'm sawing a compound angle. If I'm normally sawing a 90 degree shoulder that runs perfectly plumb, now I'm sawing at, off the plumb angle and off the face angle. So in order to do that, I have to be able to see that line and I kind of have to work through it um, step by step. So what I'm going to do is start my cut shallowly across the face. So I have a kerf that now runs on that angle across the face. Now I'm going to saw down the, the edge near me, which is at a slight angle. And I'm going to use that as a guide to match my angle on the opposite face. Or if I really want to be careful here, I'm going to lean the toe down and saw down that face. Here again, we're dealing with a pretty shallow tendon cheek. So that cut is good to go. At the same time, not only do I have 
I have an angle across the face, an angle across the thickness, and I actually have a downward angle as well. Because of the angle of the tenon here, this cut on this side is shallower than it is on that side. It's just angled all over the place. Rather than freaking out about it, I just follow the lines. I can see those lines. I can now saw to those lines. We're gonna let the saw do the work here, step two. I'm gonna saw out the center of this bridle. So I need to let the saw do the work. I could use this carcass saw. What do we know about a carcass saw? By definition, it's filed cross cut. By definition, it's probably 10 to 12 points per inch. Um, and it's about 12 inches long. That would work, but I'm gonna run into a problem with the depth of the cut here. Um, and it just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work real well. Plus it's gonna be super slow, which is gonna cause me to probably get frustrated and screw up my technique. If I switch to a tenon saw that is filed uh, more aggressively at 10 points per inch, it's filed rip, I've got bigger gullets here, and I've got an 18 inch long plate with four and a half inch depth. This is a beast of a saw that's perfect for deep bridles. So I have to saw inside my lines. So, taking long strokes, this saw is really long for this, perfect, but you can see if I'm, not only am I using the whole plate, which is gonna be more efficient anyway, but all of this material, all of this saw sticking out of here, it allows that saw just to drop out. The saw continues to cut efficiently because it's allowing all that dust to drop out. It's also pitched in such a way that it, won't gum up with sawdust. In other words, the gullets are large enough because I've got a more aggressive pitch than my carcass saw. The gullets are deep enough that they don't gum up with sawdust over the course of this, you know, whatever the width of this cut is. Now, principle one, we just used. You can see the line, you can saw the line. I stop my cut at my baseline on this side, stop the cut on the baseline on this side. I have an angled baseline now. No big deal because I can see that line so I can saw to that line. Now we're gonna repeat the whole thing on the other side. I get comments on YouTube a lot about, no, you make sawing look so easy. Well, that's principle number two. If you let the saw do the work, it is easy. It's not a strenuous activity because all I'm doing is just lightly pushing this thing back and forth. The saw is doing all the heavy lifting. And when you muscle that saw, you push too hard, you don't move smoothly or you're moving erratically and not using the whole plate, you're not letting the saw do the job. And it, it doesn't cut as efficiently and it does look more difficult because it is more difficult. Let's go ahead and illustrate principle number three. This is gonna be a little bit hairier. I've got an angle along this baseline. I've got an angle across the end grain. The baseline's already cut. So the cheek should drop away when I get to that cut. That's how I prefer to do tenons. The difficulty here comes in the fact that the angle is across, it's this way. So in order for me to position, to, to embrace principle number three in maintaining a single geometric plane, I have to angle the saw, which automatically breaks my wrist. I've got, you know, here's the angle of the saw and my hand is in line with that, but my wrist is off, my elbow's off, my shoulder's off. And I can't move my body anymore because there's a bench in the way. So what I've got to do, I'm just gonna have to saw from the other side of the bench. That's the only way to handle this. So I'm gonna angle it this way. And I have to saw from this side because now I've got the saw angled here so I can, I can position my body and move my trash can a little, but I've got the ability to step you know, left and right in order to remove that angle from my wrist that's causing the, the angle of the saw plate to deviate from uh, the single geometric plane. So I line up my saw on the cut just by eye, sighting down the saw plate. The principle here 
is not only do I have to maintain that geometric plane, I need to do it comfortably. If I am off balance, I'm gonna alter that plane in the middle of my cut. Now, right now, I'm completely wrong. The saw is approximately on there. I'm breaking my wrist, my elbow, everything's out of line. So I have to take that step back. That brings my elbow into, or brings my, my forearm into line, brings my elbow into line, and brings my shoulder. Everything is nicely aligned. I feel like I'm a little twisted. My body's a little twisted here. Let me adjust my front foot, get into a nice comfortable stance that I know that I can sustain, and then recheck that. Here's the saw plate. There's my wrist, my elbow, my shoulder. I'm good. And I'm sawing, keeping the middle. So I'm gonna saw to the right side of the line. Now we're back to principle number two. Long saw strokes. Let this saw saw. Don't force it. Don't be erratic, be smooth. Let the sawdust clear. And now, principle number one. I can see that I'm a little ways away from my line. I can also see that the cheek hasn't come away yet. And now it has. So I've got a fantastically wonky cut there um, to the point where I almost ran out of material on this far edge. My tendon shoulder is a you know scalene triangle in here. It's at an angle here. The whole tendon shoulder is, or whole tendon cheek is canted off to the side. And double check all this alignment, double check my stance. I feel good, feel comfortable. Now you notice a lot of times I will saw tenons in multiple steps where I'm flipping and rotating the board. In this case, I don't really have the luxury to do that because of the way this angle is. Now, I'm gonna lean over and look at where I am, but I'm not gonna saw while I'm doing that because when I lean over, what happens is, is I throw my shoulder out of alignment and that's going to cause the saw to go wonky. So I'm just double checking. I'm gonna recheck that geometric plane. All right, I'm there, but it's not coming off. I think I'm a little bit off on my shoulder cut. So, and that's principle number one. I can see that I've hit my baseline here. I can see that I've hit my baseline. I actually went a tiny bit over my baseline there, but the, the tendon cheek's not coming off. So in a perfect world, you've hit all those lines. I'm going to just come back and There it is. I wasn't quite to my line on this side. So now I've got super funky tenon. You've heard of the funky chicken? This is a funky tenon. It is all kinds of angles. I mean, look, look at the, look at the shoulder on that. It is ridiculous. <laughs> it's a scalene triangle. The whole like craziness of cutting these joints because who, who knows what those angles are? And that's the beauty of it. I don't have to set a compound miter gauge or any of that stuff. I just have to, principle one, see the line to saw to that line. When you get these weird twisted angles, if you are trying to muscle that saw through or you're using a saw that's not quite appropriate to it, you're gonna have trouble. So. Principle number two, let the saw do the work. And then most importantly in, a, in an exercise like this, because everything is completely off of the norm, you gotta maintain that, that plane. Those three things come up in every single cut you make. If you are sawing and you discover my cut went off, my cut was out of plumb, my cut was off the angle on the face, my cut wasn't consistent, it wasn't a straight cut, it kind of curved, Step back and look at what you did, and I guarantee you one of those three things you didn't pay attention to. One of those three things didn't happen. If you check the box in all three of those, your cuts will be perfect. The one thing I can tell you is those hand sawing principles apply even to a saw this big. In fact, probably even more to a saw this big. 
I hope you enjoyed that just brief look. I mean, that lesson in the Hintle School is, I think it's about an hour and 20 minutes long. It's the same lesson that I've taught to, I don't know, 20, 30 different woodworking guilds all across the United States. And every single time I do it, I get these kind of head slap reactions in the audience because all of the problems you have with sawing can be boiled down to those principles. And you can kind of step back and think about why is this going wrong and how does it relate to those sawing principles? So I hope you enjoyed this look at some of the content that you can find at the Hand Tool School. I'm trying to kind of open up the, the vault a little bit and show you just the vast array of things that we cover at the Hand Tool School. What I like about it is depending on how you learn, there's an approach that you can focus on. If you're totally lost and you need guidance step by step by step, that's what we have our semesters set up for. You've Build, you follow a lesson, then you build a small project that applies that school, and then you move on to the, to the next lesson, then you build a small project that applies that skill, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until many times there's like a final project like this tool cabinet that you build at the end. Or maybe you're the type of person that prefers to learn in context. Like I wanna learn mortars and tenons by building a table. Well, we have projects that you can focus on, and each one of those projects will focus on certain skills. Or maybe you already know, like I wanna improve my ability to cut through dovetails. Well, we have lessons for sale on dovetails, or you can get all of it. We have a subscription model, much like something like Netflix or your gym membership, where you pay a recurring amount every single month or maybe an annual amount, and you get access to all of it. Hundreds and hundreds of lessons, thousands upon thousands of hours of content, semesters, projects, individual lessons, sharpening content, tool building, you name it, it's all there. In fact, there's a heck of a lot that's available just to apprentice subscribers that's not available if you went and bought every single semester and bought every single project. There still would be content that only subscribing apprentices get. So there is a lot there and I just kind of want to shine a light on it. But more importantly, in this particular lesson, forget about the sales pitch. Forget about me telling you to go to handtoolschool.net. You like that subtle little sales pitch? Forget about the sales pitch. Seriously, think about your hand sawing and think about how these principles of sawing can make you a better sawyer. Because if you're sawing better, everything else in your wood shop is going to go better. I guarantee that.